Hey guys, Colin here, hope you're well. Today I'm going to take a look at a vulnerability which I've already covered in a previous video actually, which is CVE 2017 11882, which is a stack buffer overflow vulnerability within Microsoft Office's equation editor. Um, so I've already taken a look at the malware side of things, but I actually wanted to take a deeper dive on the stack buffer overflow element uh, and just kind of give you a primer on buffer overflows and talk about the assembly language and how memory is laid out and how uh, bad guys overflow buffers and um, use that to their advantage in order to uh, to uh, execute code on a machine. Um, so this will be a bit of a primer uh, if you're not really familiar with low-level memory concepts. Um, and we'll just kind of go over the, uh, the terminology and some of the uh, kind of notation that's involved and, and also show you in a live environment uh, the actual uh, exploit firing in the context of uh, a sample which takes advantage of this particular CVE. So we'll look at behavioral analysis. I'll talk to you about equation editor and just explain what that is in just a second. I'll show you just uh, roughly talk about the anatomy of the attack uh, and then we'll get into the meat of it in, in terms of what is a stack, what is a buffer, how do you overflow it uh, and then we'll go back to the malware and we'll debug it. So we'll run it again but this time we'll run it in a debugger and we'll look at the assembly language involved uh, so you can see kind of, kind of like how easy it is for bad guys to exploit this um, but actually how uh, maybe complicated it might be at the same time to actually go finding these vulnerabilities and why this is uh, a super cool vulnerability that was found as part of a bit of research. Um, so let's first off do some behavioral analysis. I'm in my 32-bit Windows 7 VM here. I've got Burp Suite running just to proxy my internet traffic. Uh, and also I'm just going to run Process Monitor here uh, just to monitor processes being created and exiting. And I've got the malware. So from a victim's point of view, if you double-click this malware and it executes, uh, so obviously this is just a Word file, obviously this is going to load up. Uh, and what we see on, uh, in just a second on the screen, we just get whatever the content is of the Word file. And we can see here it says enable editing. Well, actually, it doesn't ask me to enable ed anything. So I'm presuming that's just in case I was in protected view, but I'm not. There's no macros to enable or anything like that involved in this particular exploit. But you can see here in Burp Suite, I've got this get request, which is fired. So this IP address forward slash x dot text has uh, been requested by Microsoft Word, right? So I didn't do anything to prompt me. It didn't prompt me to say, yes, you know, do you know, run this code or whatever. The exploit fired under the hood. So it's a really cool um, exploit that the, the bad guys have developed. Let's have a look from a process perspective what happened. Let me maximize the screen here. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, Explorer runs uh, Office or WinWord, which is uh, just me double clicking the file. And as a result of that, this separate process, so not a child process of Word, uh, but this separate process, EQNEDT32, which is equation editor uh, fired, uh, and uh, that invoked MSHTA, and MSHTA being a, a kind of live off the land binary, uh, was fed the parameter of the URL, so HTTP blah 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 uh, x dot text, and there's actually you can see some trailing other bytes here as well, uh, and, and you'll see in just a second what that equates to. Um, but uh, yeah, so MSHTA was fed into uh, somewhere, was fed into the code of Equation Editor, and we'll work out how that happened in just a second when we rip apart the the actual exploit. Um, but really interesting to know that uh, Microsoft Equation Editor is involved. What do I mean by Microsoft Equation Editor? Well, let me, uh, if you go to start a new and just create a new document, for example, uh, well, if you go to insert and equation, you get options here to insert like fancy uh, mathematical no notation. So if you wanted to write uh, like an equation, for example, here, like a fraction two thirds, well, you can you can represent that in a proper kind of notate mathematical notation. And that uses um, a piece of code called equation editor. So in order to edit that and render it, um, Office is bundled with it, this Microsoft equation editor. So that's cool. Let me just exit that. Uh, and we'll close down this piece of uh, malware for now. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, clear my history in Burp Suite just so we're ready to come back to it in just a second. So Equation Editor, it's, in, it's included in all versions of Office for compatibility. It enables you to insert and edit equations in documents, and it's compiled, most importantly, with our essential protective measures. So it was written like the best part of 20 years ago, um, and therefore uh, the kind of security measures that we have today in the operating systems, such as ASLR or DEP, um, don't really, uh, weren't built into this particular binary, uh, and therefore it runs without those protection mechanisms, and more so because it runs as a separate process to Word, um, in this particular case anyway. So Word doesn't invoke it as a child process, it's invoked as a separate process, so therefore it's running in its own context, so you don't even get the kind of protective bubble around what, uh, what you would normally get with the office environment. So that's super interesting.
So let's have a look at the anatomy of attack. Usually what happens is you'll receive a malicious email with the attachment or a URL to go and fetch the uh, malicious payload. And it's usually what I've seen in the wild is a doc file or a PowerPoint file. Uh, but you can, uh, there are definitely other variants like RTF files, obviously, uh, as well as um, Excel and, and all, all the rest of it. Uh, they're normally the ones I've seen are well-crafted. Uh, there's some really ridiculous examples and, and really poor fishes, but usually these, these guys put together well-crafted emails and the exploit um, is the most interesting bit. So the file itself, uh, so in this case, the doc file, it contains an embedded equation, which we know because equation editor is launched, but the equation is crafted in such a way to overflow a buffer, which stores the font name. So obviously when you display something like that fraction that we put on the screen in just uh, a few minutes ago, if you display a fraction, it's in a particular font. And so how the code handles that font in the background, well, first off, it's gonna store that font name in a variable somewhere, and we just call that variable a buffer. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, what the researchers have found within this piece of code is the buffer that um, stores the variable or the font name um, only uh, ha has a maximum bound, right? So in this particular case, it can only store 40 bytes, but there's no error checking around it. So if you stuff it with a few extra bytes, and in this, in this particular case, 48 bytes, uh, you can overflow the buffer and make the code uh, point to a different direction uh, and therefore execute code uh, that the attacker controls. Um, so in this particular example, only only a small amount of code can actually be executed. So um, that ma that 48 bytes, so we can overflow the buffer by a maximum of eight bytes. We can't actually go any further than that. And I think some research has taken um, ha has been undertaken that um, you, th that means that uh, more code can be executed. But for the context of this example, we can only execute up to 48 bytes. So we can't stuff an entire executable into those 48 bytes because obviously it's just not big enough. But we, what the bad guys can do is they can stuff in uh, enough code to generate a HTTP request. Uh, uh, and that, that takes slightly less than 48 bytes. Uh, and, and that's what we saw before, right? We saw a GET request uh, to an IP address, forward slash x dot text or whatever it was. And that will invoke uh, a response. And that response will be executed by MSHTA. And that will be the additional badness. And in this particular case, it was delivering TrickBot. Uh, so that's the kind of anatomy of the attack. So let's get into the ribs of it then. So what's a stack and what's a buffer and what's a buffer overflow? Well, let's let's talk about what a stack is first. And I, I kind of stole this uh, picture from somewhere on the internet. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a diagram of what memory looks like in the context of your application. So if you uh, imagine you compile some C code into an executable and you double click it, well, the operating system is going to give you a chunk of memory uh, and that chunk of memory that you're given. Uh, and there's some artistic license here that says it's between zero and four gigabytes. But there's some um, that chunk of memory is laid out in a particular structure and uh, the layout at the right at the bottom you can see the text segment uh, so all of your code and stuff and your instructions will be held in the text uh, area and then there's some stuff which is uh, initialized and uninitialized data so if you initialize your variables like global variables for example uh, they'll be uh, next to that text section and all of that stuff is known at compile time and so when you compile your variable, your, your C code or whatever language you, you program in, um, and you compile it, the compiler knows about this code in, 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 to begin with. And so can order it, order that, uh, those uh, constants or those uh, the instructions, what have you, in that particular layout. And then right at the top, when the process starts to run, you can see there's command line arguments and environment variables. And that's where they kind of live in that structure. And beneath those two, stuff which occurs at runtime, which is what we're interested in at the moment, um, is the stack and the heap. And you can see there's a bit of a, an area between them and no man's land in between the stack and the heap. And that's because the, the heap will actually grow upwards uh, towards higher memory addresses and the stack will grow downwards towards lower memory addresses and, and sometimes they meet in the middle and it can get a little bit interesting but effectively those are kind of variable sized um, data structures in that in, in the portion of memory that the operating system has given you. Now, I'm not going to talk about the heap. We're interested in the stack today because this is a stack buffer overflow. And so what the stack is responsible for is for storing your local variables uh, in the context of the functions that are within your code. So you might have, uh, I don't know, a calculator application. It might have a, a function for multiplication. And within that function, you might have some variables being declared. So like, I don't know, one variable to multiply by another variable. You might declare them in your function. And therefore, those variables are going to be pushed onto the stack um, when that function is invoked. So your code might invoke that function at a particular point in the code, and therefore it's going to create itself what's called a stack frame. So as part of that stack, you're going to be given a stack frame. Um, and then 
um, the stack frame on the stack frame we're going to see a few elements pushed to it and some of those elements are going to be the local variables that you've declared now when your function has finished it's going to pop those those that stuff off the stack uh, and it's going to it's going to destroy the actual stack frame uh, and it does so in what's called a lifo fashion so the stack is a lifo data structure which means it's last in first out and you can conceptualize that as a bunch of dinner trays and if you were stacking up dinner trays in a canteen for example um, well if you wanted to get to the bottom of the pile well you need to start taking from the top and removing the last one that you just put in so the last one in is the first one out and then you can take the next one the next one the next one and eventually the last one will be the first one that you put in so that's the kind of stack and how it fits into a uh, context of your memory. Uh, well, what's, what, what does that mean in, in the context of a buffer overflow? Well, I, I've, I've, uh, instead of drawing a, um, a vertical diagram of, of memory layout and indeed the stack, I've drawn it horizontally here at the bottom with this colorful kind of table. Um, and I think it's just easier to kind of conceptualize stuff uh, when we're talking about code that's executing. So just bear with me on this. Uh, I've got a bit of C code, which is super simple. It's got two functions. One is main, one is foo and all main does is declares a variable called my string and it declares the value of hello into my string and then it passes hello um, into the function call of foo and then so foo as you can see at the top here it just takes one argument which is a, which is a, a string and it declares a buffer and the buffer is uh, of size six bytes so I can fit six bytes in, into my buffer and then it calls stir copy which is a vulnerable piece of code right and stir copy is just going to take whatever I pass it in this case the string hello and it's going to pop and it's going to copy that buffer it, copy that string into the buffer uh, but the buffer can only take six bytes but that's okay because hello is a five a, a five byte string uh, it's actually six bytes and we'll see see why in just a second but it's five characters right uh, and each character is a byte so hopefully all, all will be well in my code so what happens when we step through this well the first thing that happens when i call foo uh, well, it knows the, uh, the the compiler knows that um, foo takes a, a parameter, uh, and that parameter in this case is the string hello. So it's going to push that parameter to the stack, and in this case, we'll, we're just going to say that that parameter was stored in EAX. So the first thing it does is it pushes it to the stack, and then that means that foo can actually reference that parameter and use it to do whatever it needs to do in the function. The next thing it does when we call the function, um, the return address of where to go next after the function is finished is going to be pushed to the stack as well, and that return address is held in a a register called EIP which is the instruction pointer so when I call foo well that's fine I can call foo all I like but I need to know after foo where do I need to come back to and that's the address which is pushed to the stack next and then after that what also we need to know is well okay well what was my previous stack frame where was that in memory and that at the moment is stored in the EBP register so sometimes called the frame pointer also also called the base pointer and that, that kind of points to the base of the of the stack frame uh, and so we need to know where the old one was uh, so once we finish again once we finish with foo we, we can then go back to uh, where the base pointer was for main for example and then we can reference the variables in main so we need to kind of preserve uh, the initial the, the existing stack frame so that's essentially what that's doing and then when we when we call foo so we declared our buffer in memory and we can and that's kind of represented here in in um in pink or purple uh, and i've got six bytes six bytes available to me so when i call stir copy i'm going to copy um, whatever is in argument one, I'm going to copy it into that into that buffer into those, those six bytes that I've uh, kind of allocated for myself. And you can see here that hello, the string hello fits quite nicely into that into those six bytes. So uh, in order to determine where the end of a string is, you always have a trailing null byte, which is this slash zero character here at the end. Uh, so hello, a five character string is actually six bytes in length. So that fits perfect into into our into our buffer, and everything the world is good. Uh, so what happens if you overflow the buffer? Well, stir copy is a vulnerable piece of code code in as much as it doesn't check that I'm only copying six bytes into my six byte buffer. Uh, it will just carry on copying anything that I pass it into the buffer, regardless of how many bytes is, uh, the, the, the compiler is allocated to my buffer. Uh, and so I've only, I'm only meant to have six. I was only given six by my declaration of, of buffer. Um, but instead, I've passed it in, in this particular example, the string hello you with an exclamation mark on the end of it. So it in fact goes to, um, you know, it overflows it by another four bytes. So what we find is we have a 10 byte string um, well, I've only got a six byte buffer, so I've overwritten the buffer by four bytes. And you can see in this particular case, because uh, EBP, which was the old stack frame pointer, was pushed to the stack, and that was immediately in memory before my, my buffer, 
well, I've overflowed EBP. So what's going to happen is Foo's going to execute. We're going to go back to the return address and then main just won't know, you know, the context of its whole stack frame. So it's probably going to crash and that's not a good thing. And a crash is one thing, but actually what the bad guys really want to do is redirect the code. And so if they can influence the return address to an address which um, houses code in memory that they have access to and they know uh, they, they can control, well, that's a good thing for the bad guys. So if they overflow the buffer in this particular case by a another four bytes, so overflow EVP and EIP as well, which is the return address, then they can control where the, where the code is going to return to once foo is finished executing. And so if you feed it a string in this particular example, which is another four bytes in length, so hello there, and then instead of it just being a random string, we actually feed it a return address. So in this particular case, I fed it 120C4300. Uh, then in fact, what's going to happen is when I start popping things off the stack, when foo is going to, uh, when, when we finish calling foo and the stack frame is being destroyed, um, what's going to happen is stuff is going to get popped off the stack in reverse order because remember it's last in first out so the return address 00430c12 is actually now going to be the return address so it's now no longer whatever it was we previously pushed to the stack in order to get back to main the bad guys have, have um injected their own return address and we're now going to go there into the code so might well crash at some stage but the return address is what's really important in this particular example so let's take a, a, con a look at in the context of this particular sample again uh, and let me just uh, clear out my history here in burp suite and so it'll become clear in just a second i'm going to use this super cool piece of code called g flags which will enable me to um, uh, stop or launch a debugger rather when a particular sample is uh, or a particular process is spawned so in this in this particular case, we want to launch the debugger when equation editor is launched. Um, and so let me untick that. Let me press apply. Let me get rid of that. And so hopefully when I run the malware this time, what's going to happen is we'll get uh, x32dbg pop up, which it does, it does here. Uh, and let's just go to uh, the code. I'm going to jump into where the code lives in memory. Um, once it's finished analyzing, we're about 50, 60% there. So hurry up, come on, we'll get there. Uh, and what we're going to do is let's just jump to a particular location um, for oh, six, five, oops, six, five, five. That's great. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. So a couple of pieces of um, syntax to look at here. So it might look a little bit complicated to begin with. This particular call, so we can see here, um, this is the call to a vulnerable function. And we'll talk about the function in just a second. But we have a parameter that's pushed to the function. It was stored in EAX and it's going to push it to uh, to the stack and then it's going to call the function so the first thing that happens i'm going to run it first and we can see here just to give you an example we have the font name in this in this vulnerable function and we'll talk about the buffer and stuff in just a second we can see that for example the string times new roman has been pushed uh, and it stores in edx register and in eax and we'll see in just a second this is the length of the string so the length of the actual font name which is going to be stored in the buffer and so in this particular example it's 10 that's hexadecimal for 16 in real money so we've got a 16 byte buffer or a 16 byte value you rather which is going to be stored in the buffer now this particular buffer can only take 40 bytes and that's its maximum and 40 in hexadecimal is 28 so it can only take this 10 hexadecimal byte buffer um, string it fits nicely into our 28 byte uh, buffer so all all is well in this particular example if i press f9 again what i'm going to find is we now find ourselves at the call to the vulnerable function that's great and we can see here so the um whatever is in eax was passed as a parameter to this particular function uh, and so what is being passed here we can uh, follow in the dump the value in eax so we can see rather than it being like times new roman or whatever font we can see that it's the bad guy's code mshta blah 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 and then a few other bytes as well that go with it so 20 20 20 20 blah 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 so a load of padding by the bad guys and then we see here 120c4300 and and, we, and x32 makes it really easy for us to understand what that is if you hover over it you can see that it it uh, puts it in reverse order for you and you can see that memory address is actually where the code winexec lives and winexec is a piece of code which can execute a function uh, or execute a command rather that you feed it and we'll see that in just a second so let's take a step through into the code here uh, and then what we're going to find is um, we're in the code and uh, we've, we've kind of called a few things already, and I'm going to explain to you. We're, we're right in uh, just at the point where the buffer is about to uh, about to be overflown, so it, which is why I've set this kind of breakpoint here for us. But we can see here, remember the length of the string that we're going to use in the buffer 
um, is stored in EAX. So here we've got 30 in hexadecimal and that equates to 48 bytes. So we've got a 40 byte buffer and we're stuffing it with 48 bytes. And the reason why we're stuffing it with 48 is because four bytes are gonna overwrite EBP, which is the old stack frame. And the other four bytes are gonna overwrite the return address, which is which was uh, what we pushed from EIP. And that's really what the bad guys wanna control because they wanna get to where this code is for WinExec. They wanna redirect the code to WinExec. Uh, and then EDX stored the actual value of the font. So previously that was Times New Roman. And in this particular case, if I follow it and dump again, it's exactly the location we were in the dump, but it's this particular code. So instead of the font name Times New Roman or whatever, this is the, the whole uh, kind of string that we're feeding into uh, this particular buffer. Now, what we do in here, let me just take a couple of instructions back. So this instruction here, load effective address uh, of into EDI, whatever lives in uh, this particular loca memory location, EBP minus 28. And this is something that's held in the stack segment. It's a double word pointer. That's all that means. But EBP minus 28 is a 28 byte buffer, aka a 40 byte buffer in decimal um, that uh, we're going to overflow. There's no bounds checking involved here, which is this is the vulnerable buffer itself. All this instruction is doing is loading that address. So loading whatever is in EBP minus 28, we're loading that buffer and we're going to get it ready and we're going to put it into EDI. And EDI is going to be the destination of what we're going to copy. And then the next instruction here, move ESI or move EDX into ESI. All that says is move whatever font the bad guy has um, or whoever uh, has declared in memory just move that into ESI. So we've got ESI as the source of our copy and we've got EDI as the destination. So S for source and D for destination, you can kind of think of it. Uh, this, where I've breakpointed here, so shift right uh, by two ECX is just gonna convert the size uh, of the buffer into, into D words. So rather than treat it as bytes, it's gonna, it's gonna change it to D words. Uh, so let me do that. And you can see here that it changes it uh, in, uh, in ECX here. Uh, and then also um, the next instruction which is repeat until equal to zero and then move SD. And then what move SD means, it's gonna move whatever's in the EDI register, it's gonna move, it, uh, sorry, whatever's in the ESI register, which is the source of our copy, it's gonna move it to the EDI register until that string equals to zero. So it's a simple copy instruction. It's gonna copy whatever is in uh, ESI as a source, and it's gonna co and it's gonna move it into EDI. So you can see here that what's in the registers. We can see that whatever's in ESI at the moment, which is 12F350, which is exactly the the bad guy's um, font name, which is MSHTA, obviously not a real font. Well, that's gonna copy that into EDI, and then it's gonna do some other stuff. But what we're gonna do in the in in the process is we're gonna overflow EBP. So if we have a look and follow the value of EBP in the dump, we can see it's got some value there at the moment. But actually, if we kind of step through the code. Uh, hopefully what we'll see is um, this execute and we can see that EBP now has 20, 20, 20 and then 12, 0, C, uh, 43, 0, 0, et cetera, et cetera. Now let me just flip to the, the return of this particular code, uh, this particular function, and we can see all those 20s in EBP. And now the return address has been overflowed as well. So the next instruction, well, we find ourselves at WinExec. Well, actually, well, that's fantastic from the bad guy's point of view because WinExec was already built into this code. So they've got a win-win situation here. They just kind of pointed it to the right direction. But actually what they've also found is that uh, because they've pushed, pushed that value to the stack, uh, well, WinExec just takes whatever, whatever was on the stack previous to it, it takes that as, as its parameter and is going to start executing it. So you just feed WinExec a parameter and it's just going to run it for you as a command line argument. And so what's been pushed to the stack here in our stack window, you can see 0012F350. Well, that indeed, if you remember, was exactly where the, the bad guy's font was, which is down here. Uh, so you can see, let me just uh, just jump to it a little bit clearer. So 12 uh, F350, uh, and we can see, so um, the value that's been pushed to um, WinExec is MSHTA, HTTP, blah, 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 blah. And then, but also you get the trailing stuff as well. So all of this like padding and stuff, which is those th um, kind of weird bytes that we saw. So we haven't called WinExec yet. So let me just like press F8. Just, and we'll call that, and you can see that just doing that one line of instruction has caused uh, that get request to perform. Now, if I carry on the code and press F9, you can see in the bottom left here, I get first chance exception, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's because like EVP was overwritten. So like there's no contact, it can't reference stuff, and it's, it's gonna crash, it's all confused now and stuff, and the code's gonna, gonna exit. But guess what? It doesn't really matter from the bad guy's point of view because um, the fun stuff has already happened. We've already seen the get request occur as well. So that's how you overflow a buffer, and that's how you do it in real life. We've talked to you about some context around it as well and some theory and stuff. So hopefully that's of use to you, uh, and hopefully that gives you a bit more of a primer into buffer overflows. Thanks, guys.